I'm here to talk to you today about an environmental curve within the toxic release inventory. Well, sorry, sorry, my name is Ben Sabbath. My advisor was Dr. <laughs> Johannes Schmieder, a lovely German man who cannot be with, here today with us, unfortunately. So, you're probably asking yourself, seeing this title, what is the environmental Kuznets curve, the EKC? Well, it's a hypothesized relationship between income and pollution. The theory predicts an inverted U-shaped curve with a turning point level of income where, oh, um, that was the wrong button. <laughs> where at a certain level of um, GDP per capita or income, people, which um, GDP per capita, which rises with initial, um, which as it goes up, emissions also increase, begins to turn down and decrease at a certain level of income as people make choices to, um, or make choices to reduce their personal level of, of pollution that they create and or are exposed to. So there are a couple of potential theoretical explanations. The first is that increase is due to economic activity creating income. That is fairly well established. That as economic activity goes on, pollution in the form of admissions or toxic chemicals released in the environment is created. But the um, there are th multiple theories for the decline that comes with the EKC theory. The first is the temporal theory. It's the, more, it's the one that has been studied more and has been talked about more. Where as time goes on, as technology increases, pollution decreases. For example, you can see this with, with wealthier people purchasing solar panels for their roofs or um, buying hybrid cars, electric cars, which are more expensive than traditional cars. The other theory that I think is more realistic and more interesting is what I term the spatial theory. It's that as people become wealthier, they're exposed, they, they're living in the environments where they're working and they're being exposed to the pollution. That's not so great. I, I personally would rather not live right next to a factory belching out smoke. I'm think, pretty sure that's like a fairly universal feeling. So what these people do, the people that can afford to, they move away from the pollution. The pollution does not, is not decreased. They are simply, the people that can afford to are simply not exposed to it. So what does this look like? Here we have a lovely view of Shai Shai Beach in Northwestern Washington. I, I don't know who that person is. Um, this is gorgeous, clean, the air is perfect, They're, the trees are very tall, but it's not a great place to live. There is nowhere to work. The closest um, small town is a small town called Nia Bay on Native American Reservation, the Macaw Reservation, which has an unemployment rate of 50%. There are drug problems, alcohol problems throughout the region. The largest um, economic center in the region is Forks, Washington, which is not exactly a boom town. Um, there are vampires, though. So let's say you don't want to live in Forks. You get on the road going south, go down around Puget Sound, and you end up in South Seattle in the Duwamish River Valley, or on the Duwamish River. This is also not a great place to live. There are jobs. You can work in a concrete factory. You can work elsewhere. but um, it's, you know, there, there are some downsides. It might or may not be a super fun site. Um, super funds are not super fun. And, you know, it's, you don't want to live there either. If you can afford to, you want to head a little farther east to Bellevue, Washington, home of high-tech industry. Bill Gates lives there, Paul Allen. Beautiful, relatively clean. And, you know, it's a little more expensive. Just a little bit. So... You can see this qualitatively, but how, what have previous quantitative studies found regarding the EKC? There has, as a matter of fact, been mixed evidence, and it depends on the pollutant being studied. Um, studies done in the 90s found that there appears to be an EKC over time when, with sulfur dioxide, which makes sense, because there's a direct, experienceable um, negative impact. Acid rain comes with sulfur dioxide. But studies studying um, less obviously impactful um, pollutants such as CO2 have been less conclusive. So what's my project? I'm attempting to isolate evidence for the EKC in the EPA toxic release inventory data. I'm particularly interested in the spatial hypothesis. Um, the, no one has ever studied the EKC um, before using this data set. And my, this data set is especially unique in that I can look at, at the county level and study at a higher geographic um, spatial resolution than has ever been studied before. So what does my data look like? 
The toxic release inventory is a record of um, individual chemical releases by factory, by chemical, for each year from 1986 to the present. Within, the da within that data set, I can observe the address of a facility and the chemical that was released, as well as the um, area that it was released to. The chemicals within this data set were chosen based on proven toxic influence to the environment. Um, I summed up these chemicals by county to create an observation for each county and each year recording each, the, um, the amount of pounds of chemical that were released in that year in that county. I ultimately chose to only study carcinogens because the data was incredibly messy due to, um, uh, I think there was a mining rupture at some point in the mid-90s that led to just a huge amount of noise that would make it tough to compare from year to year. My um, income data came from the Bureau of Economic Analysis which just was a nice way of knowing what the average income as well as total income in each county were from 1989 to 2010. Um, I, to test the accuracy of this data, I compared it to the official Federal Reserve um, average income data, and it, they appeared to follow the same path, leading me to believe that this data was accurate. So the geographical spread of um, pollution looks like this. I'm very proud of this map. Um, it may or may not be a, close to a population density map of the US. But I think you, know, you can see some patterns. There's a focus, there's a lot of pollution in Southern California, Southern Arizona, and some in the mountainous regions of um, Pennsylvania and the coal mining areas and, the, and through the Cascade Mountain region as well. Income even more directly tra um, tracks population density. The, the, more, the redder the county, the wealthier the county. And you can see there's a big, folk, um, big concentration in the Northeast Corridor, as well as Southern California, and some in Washington, as well as Chicago. I'm, I'm going to spare you this, but if you flip back and forth between these pictures really quickly, you can kind of see something that may or may not indicate the EKC. What's a better way to get a feel for the EKC is making graphs. Here is my initial scatter plot. I, um, been, I used. Um, selective averaging to create this graph, otherwise you just see a giant cloud of data. But rather than seeing the expected um, U-shaped curve, we see a clear downward um, trend we don't control for anything, which may be the dominance of technology over time reducing pollution without any real focus of income, because income goes up, technology increases, time goes on, pollution goes down. A better way to look at this graphically is to control for either space or time. First, I chose to control for time, effectively testing the temporal hypothesis by creating a series of quadratic fit curves for each state. This is a subset of them, and there's no real obvious pattern here. When I chose to control for a um, year, if I say, all right, we're going to we'll create a different graph for each year, effectively hold technology constant and test the spatial hypothesis, we see clear evidence of the predicted UK, um, U-shaped curve within each year consistently, leading to believe that the spatial hypothesis may in fact be correct. <laughs> to back up my graphical analysis, I did a series of linear regressions, both um, semi-parametric regressions, just to trace the, um, the shape of a relationship without choosing any functional form, as well as fixed effect regressions, which controlled for um, local effects and time-specific effects, all of which showed um, Evans for EKC. I'm going to spare you going regression by regression and instead show you the implied turning points for, of income for each of these regressions. When I controlled for <coughs> sorry, um, county fixed effects, effectively testing the temporal hypothesis, I found a very low turning point level of income, indicating that we are most likely on the downward trending section of the EKC with regard to time. However, when I looked at um, year fixed effects, I found a, a level of income that was more reasonable to, um, that was within the range of income that people actually experience, indicating that the year fixed effects is a test of the spatial hypothesis, and the spatial hy hypothesis may in fact be correct. However, when I control for both county and year fixed effects, effectively ignoring, um, say if we ignore time and ignore space, Effectively, looking at people's preferences alone, we see a much higher turning point level of income, indicating that once the, the initial um, simple, effectively, intercept shifting forms are controlled for, there may or may not be an actual desire to, lo to lower pollution on the same level 
simply based on moving or technology increasing. So the final thoughts that I have about this, the spatial effect appears real. People do avoid pollution by moving. However, they don't actually work to reduce this pollution without just general technological process. Even though the temporal effect operates on a larger time scale, this still may not, you don't know how long the time scale is. As um, John Maynard Keene said, in the long run, we're all dead. So <laughs> we don't need to worry. We, we, long run stuff may or may not actually be important to our real lives. Initially, within my study, I did not address other factors, such as the influence of race, industry type and area. And I think, especially looking at um, the Flint water crisis, there, may or may, there is an effect of race on pollution that I think should be addressed with later studies. Um, these are my references, and now I'm open for questions. <laughs> yes, Elena. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if you looked, uh, well, I saw that you looked state by state, right? Mm -hmm. And was that controlling for like the average income of those states? Or do you think that that could also have an effect that you know people who are in Pennsylvania where there is mining would move away from the pollution but remain in the state? So that's, um, in the graphical things, that is a um, concern that I have. Um, part of it is those graphs only represent the income range found within each of those states. Yeah. Additionally, um, that's, I just didn't want to have to make thousands of graphs to look yeah. at. That was hard, be a little bit hard to interpret. So the state was, that was a simple um, basis for the graphical analysis. Mm -hmm. However, in the regression analysis, each county was given its own oh, mental indicator. So it was control, so each county got its own intercept that allowed for me to do that analysis. Um, were you able to look at any state-by-state state case bases where it seems to make sense where people with higher incomes would move away from pollution, but those people also tend to congregate in cities where statistically there's likely to be higher pollution. So how would you account for that? So actually, I examined both total pollution as well as per capita pollution. And I found EKC relationships in both total as well as per capita um, pollution. So. I think that might control for it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Christian. Do you think these findings you could apply on a country by country scale? So while it seems like to me you're making an argument for spatial, the, the curve in a spatial sense mm -hmm. in America, if you compare it to a developing country like say China or India with the United States, would the spatial argument still hold up? I think we're getting into other barriers to um, movement at this point. There's a serious language barrier. For example, let's say you wanted to move from the US to Mexico, it'd be very difficult. Um, additionally, I think there's internal barriers. Um, there can be internal barriers to movement as well. US is a free to move society. But China or traditional communist countries where it's tough to move around, I think that would reduce the spatial um, EKC hypothesis effect. Um, anything, any other questions? Thank you for listening to that talk. I'd like to. I'd like to end by thanking um, Dr. Johannes Schmieder, um, Brandon McCartney for keeping me based in truth, as well as all the friends who took the time to read an incredibly dry 30-page thesis. <laughs>